All right. We are going to sh shift gears a little bit tonight as we start into a slightly different study. And as you can see here on the screen, I'm going to be looking at this character Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there are several reasons why I think this is important. Um, I believe that the Lord has led us in this direction, uh, for sure. And I have been seeking his face on uh, exactly where we need to go next. And I had several different ideas. Habakkuk was one of them. And Galatians was one of them. But there are some issues that are really salient to my mind right now that I feel that continuing where we are in this period of historical discovery is really important. And so as we're finishing out Lamentations, we're talking about that period. We're talking about the... Uh, carrying away into captivity, um, this is what the Lord has for us right now. Um, uh, or at least that's the, this is the way my heart is leading me. And so um, because of that, then we'll be moving into the book of Daniel in the next few weeks. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit more background on this guy, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, whenever I started looking at him, uh, I, I thought it was really interesting that there are um, studies of the prophet Daniel that have the picture of the, uh, of the image and of the bears that go back several hundred years. So this is a picture from an, an early medieval uh, story uh, about Daniel's vision. And then this is actual artwork from Babylon. So this is what this is the style of art that they used. And this particular one is from the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh which is a secular text, uh, uh, epic text from Babylon and is considered one of the oldest pieces of literature that we have uh, outside the Bible. Um, but let's talk about who Nebuchadnezzar is and what his kingdom is. So he is from a tribe or ethnic group called Chaldeans. The ancient state of Chaldea from the Middle East, um, this is a, a, a short article from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, also spelled, and there's several different ones, Chaldea. Uh, the Assyrians spelled it Kaldu, K-A-L-D-U, Kazdu, and then uh, Hebrew spells it Hasdim, land in southern Babylonia. Modern southern Iraq, frequently mentioned in the Old Testament. Strictly speaking, the name apply, should be applied to the land bordering the head of the Persian Gulf between the Arabian Desert and the Euphrates Delta. So it's that that part of geography right there. Chaldea is first mentioned in the annals of the Assyrian king, Ashur Nasser Pal. Though earlier documents referred to the same area as the sea land. In 850, Shalmaneser III of Assyria raided Chaldea, reached the Persian Gulf, which he called the Sea of Kaldu. On the accession of Sargon II to Assyrian throne, the Chaldean Marduk Apla Idina II, um, known as the biblical Merodach Baladan, rule of Bityakin, a district of Chaldea seized the Babylonian throne and despite Assyrian opposition held it from 721 to 710. Now, this was the guy that came down against 
um, Israel threatened Hezekiah. I'm sorry, um, when the Assyrians came down against um, Judah and threatened Hezekiah and the Lord and Hezekiah prayed for them, the Chaldeans came um, and gave them aid. And then Hezekiah opened up all his treasure houses and the house of the Lord and showed him everything. Um, and the Lord told them then he shouldn't have done that, number one. And number two, that, you know, in the next hundred years that they would be all those things that he had showed them would actually be in the possession of the Chaldean uh, ruler. So this guy, Merodach Baladan, a uh, ruler of Bityakin, um, seized the Babylonian throne and despite Assyrian opposition, held it from 721 to 710. He finally fled, however, and Bityakin was placed under Assyrian control again. So you have this narrow window when Chaldea begins to assert itself over the, the, that area there. Um, uh, during uh, uh, between the Euphrates and the Tigris River, um, they went back under the Assyrian Empire. But then, with this decline of Assyrian power, I'm sorry, uh, a native governor Nabopolassar was able in 625 to become king of Babylon by popular consent and to inaugurate a Chaldean dynasty. That lasted until the Persian invasion of 539 BC. And the prestige of his successor, known as Nebuchadnezzar the second, the one we call Nebuchadnezzar, he is the second of the Chaldean dynasty. And Nabonidus, his his grandson, um, who saw the handwriting on the wall was such that Chaldean became synonymous with Babylonian. Okay, so the Chaldean um, dynasty ruled that area of Babylon, um, and it became uh, known as the Babylonian Empire. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar himself in the scriptures is mentioned 88 times, so he's not an insignificant character. Now, we think of him as, you know, he's just mentioned everywhere. You know, he's such a big, larger-than-life character because um, we grow up listening to the stories of Daniel and the, and the three Hebrew children, right? Or Daniel and the lion's den. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar is this larger-than-life figure, even in um, Christian and biblical circles, and um, I have here documented, he's actually mentioned two times in the historical books, in Second Kings 24 and 25, and pa the parallel passage being Second Chronicles 36, which is almost the end of the book. Um, then he's mentioned throughout the book of Jeremiah, and he's mentioned in the first five chapters of the book of Daniel. And besides that, besides those two, um, these two books, Jeremiah and Daniel, besides these two, the only other mention is a couple of times in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 26, 4, chapter 29, 18, verses 18 and 19, and chapter 30, verse 10. Okay, so most of our information about Nebuchadnezzar comes from Jeremiah. And Daniel, I had in my mind before I read this that um, he was in Isaiah as well, but he, he doesn't show up there. Isaiah was mostly directed, even though Isaiah was from the southern kingdom, um, he was during the, the period of, of, of Uz, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So he was during the Assyrian kingdom. Is when he preached and when he um, uh, ministered. And so, um, and so, whenever it uses the term of 
God shaving with a borrowed razor. It's not talking about Nebuchadnezzar. It's talking about Assyria. Assyria. And the city of Nineveh. Okay. So just a little bit of historical background there. Now this study, um, another reason that I want to talk about it is um, I have been struggling with some concepts, all right? So let me give you a little bit of a caveat to this study, if you would allow me. It's This isn't going to be political per se. Um, and I know in an election year, this can be very dangerous. Um, I don't want to be political. But I do believe that the truth has something to say about all things that happen in this world. And I think that the truth should be applied equally in all cases. It has to, something to say about people, about their ideas, about um, our theories, about what we believe. And so um, because of that, um, I think that that is my perspective that I'm coming from in looking at political theory. Um, it seems to me that the political dynamic in Babylon is closer to our status in this world as pilgrims and captives. However, I say that at the same time, I don't want to have a victim mentality, and I don't believe we should have a victim mentality as Christians. That, oh no, you know, the world is out to get us, you know, we're being persecuted. I don't see actually any persecution. Um, I maybe slight discomfort at times. We definitely um, have some people who um, who um, contradict us in the world of ideas, in the forum of ideas in which we stand for truth. We are going to have some contradictions, and we are going to face some debates. And we should be ready to answer those debates. But that's just normal um, process. I value debate. I value hearing the uh, other side. Um, I think that's the only way that truth can survive is if there is um, debate. I was going to say honest debate, even if it's not honest. Um, being able to allow other ideas to be heard and to be aired um, pre preserves us from a from a gridlock of thought that will actually stamp out the truth. So I'm not again. Not, so I'm not at all for um, only certain ideas prevailing. I believe that the um, the truth wins through persuasion and through winning hearts over one heart at a time. I don't believe it does. It operates through um, through coercion or through political in power or influence. Um, I, I see that actually as very detrimental and usually has the opposite effect of what we want. Um, Christian nations have risen and fallen over the last 2,000 years. You know, um, whenever the Goths invaded Rome in 400 AD, the Goths were a Christian nation. Odoacer, um, the king from, from what we think of as present day Austria was a Christian king and he came conquering and uh, attacking them because of the paganism that um, that Rome had fallen into after they had turned to Christianity 200 years previously. So France became, um, you know, the Christian nation. Then that moved over in England. And we know, you know, some of the um, processes of reform, you know, in northern northern Europe. You know, in, in Germany and in Switzerland um, became a haven for Christianity. 
and preserved it in, in many ways. And then it came back to Italy during the Renaissance, right? And cities like Venice and Florence began to flourish and publish Christian literature that hadn't been published in a, a thousand years. And so we have this, um, this process of cyclical movement and God always allowing the truth to continue no matter what the political and social climate is. And then on a personal note, I believe that God is a social God. He's created human society. Society is in a fallen state, and we as humans continue to experiment with society and politics um, in very creative ways, and I am eminently curious to understand that and so I'm definitely coming from a a curious and an investigative perspective, you know, wanting to understand what are the power dynamics that um, that God has instituted in His Word, and how do we as Christians align, understand, and align with what He is doing? Right. So um, this. This class is going to be focusing on power and the constructs of how this operates. Okay, so let me back up and begin um, with looking at this period of time, historically, theologically. Okay, so in order to do that, let's go to the Gospels. Let's go to the Gospels. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6 says, And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Solomon begat Roboam. Roboam begat Abiah. Abiah begat Asa. Asa begat Jeho Josaphat. And Josaphat begat Joram. And Joram begat Ozias. And Ozias begat Jotham. And Jotham begat Ahaz. And Ahaz begat Ezekias. And Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josiah, and Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. I'm going to stop there, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into ba Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Let's pray. Father, as we think about your word, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us insight? Would you enlighten us as we study your word? Would you speak to us, I pray? Give us hearts to understand, Lord, our times and what truth says about it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a, an important shift that happened here at the carrying away into Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was the instrument for that. Um, I said before that he wasn't mentioned in Isaiah. However, he was mentioned in Jeremiah. 
over and over again. And he was called Nebuchadnezzar the king, my servant. And so God considered Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And we're going to see um, his his service in many different ways. And I, I just think it is amazing how God chose to use this king and enter his, um, use his um, ambition and his domination and bless him in those things and use him to change the face of the geography. He affected migrations. He affected um, political boundaries. And most of all, of course, he accomplished God's will. Um, and so in these days, I've been very concerned about um, politics, about, you know, injustice and truth. And one of the one of the verses that has come to my mind over and over again is here in Ecclesiastes chapter four and verse one. It says, so I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of those as were oppressed and they had no comforter And on the side of their oppressors, there was power. But they had no comforter. And that is a sad commentary. It's a true commentary, and it really catches me. Solomon was a thinker. He followed um, David just as we read. And Solomon was given a, um, a conditional, a conditional um, covenant. And we we know this one. This is one of our favorite verses, right, in the church. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, if my people, and y'all could quote it with me, right, if my people, of course, that's in context of a longer thing. Um, In the surrounding verses. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And then the last um, piece of the puzzle that I want to put out, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tie up all these loose ends tonight i'm laying out the pieces give you all something to think about something to study on and then lord willing we're going to come and kind of begin to unpack it as we get into the book of daniel um the last piece of the puzzle that i'm going to put out right now is jeremiah and the new covenant and we've we've um, covered it. Um, I believe I taught on it 
two years ago in Bible school. And we talked about it um, last Wednesday night. And then Brother Johnny uh, alluded to it as well um, Sunday morning. And so in Jeremiah chapter 31, we have a transition from the old system to a new system. Or at least there was this looking forward to this transition. And it seems to me, it seems very clear to me that this carrying away into captivity was a pivotal moment. It was a historical moment that contextualized the theological movement that was happening right here with the with the um, development of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 18, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. Thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. So what we heard last evening, um, last Wednesday, was Jeremiah calling on the Lord to remember and to turn him. Right. So he was making direct allusion to this. Um, this new covenant. And I believe the carrying away of kept into captivity and the moving away from the physical temple of Jerusalem. Was a vital. Step in this process. And that's all we have um, time for tonight. Please go ahead and read Jeremiah um, and 31. And I would say beginning verse 18 all the way down to the end of the chapter. Verse 40. And the Lord bless you all tonight. Um, and we will talk about this more later. Lord bless you all. Good night.